Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, Pig Sloppin', in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. I had no idea the whole thing about 19th century and early 20th century boys wearing dresses and photos and how to know their boys would get so much attention. Hi, it is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this is Extreme Genes, America's family history show where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. All right, two stories came out of this. One listener Facebooked that she had thought that the century-old picture she inherited was of a little girl she could not place in the family. (laughs) It was her great-grandfather. And then there was this one, and I wish she had come on to tell it herself. Suzanne Brown emailed to say that her father, who was born in 1900, wore a dress as a toddler until potty trained, like we talked about. And then his father went overseas to Scotland for three years. His mother got it in her head that she wouldn't cut her son's hair again by then replete with ringlets until his father returned. And when the boy turned six, he was sent to school. Well, his mother was very quickly informed by the principal that the child's hair would have to be cut. When asked why, he said because the kid's been beating up all the other kids who were making fun of him. She didn't cut the hair. She took him out of school. And by the way, this listener has several pictures of her father in dresses at the turn of the last century. So thanks for those stories. Remember, the boys are the toddlers in dresses with the hair parted on either side or both. And the girls have their hair parted down the middle. That's good stuff to know. As mentioned last week, July is our first anniversary month on Extreme Genes. And it's awesome to think how many family history discoveries have been made by our genies in the last 12 months. And we're always excited to hear what you've dug up. Later in the show, we're going to talk to a group of guys from Alabama who literally did just that just a few days ago. Dug up a piece of 19th century family history that brought one family member to tears. We'll be talking to the gents that call themselves Task Force History in about 25 minutes. In about seven minutes, Jennifer Utley of Ancestry.com returns to talk about their new prison record release. You know, it's the stories that make your ancestors interesting, and few people left as many stories behind as people who made their way through the legal system. And we all have them. What might be in those prison records that Ancestry just released, and where and when do they cover? We'll find out in minutes. We left up our survey on your revolutionary soldiers for a couple of weeks, and 68% who answered said they had at least one soldier who fought for the Patriot side in the Revolution. 13 weren't aware of any soldiers, 6% had soldiers on both sides, and 3% had loyalist ancestors. An interesting spread of answers which really shows how much of a civil war the revolution really was. Oh, and if you haven't heard, AMC has renewed the show Turn about Washington's culper spy ring during the revolution. If you had ancestors in the Northeast during the revolution, this is an exciting program to watch. They begin rerunning the first season on Saturday nights starting in August, and season two doesn't happen until spring of next year. They're killing me. This week's survey has to do with our next segment, Are You Aware of Any Ancestors Who Were Imprisoned? This doesn't necessarily mean they committed a crime. Maybe they were just there for their own protection, right? Answer yes or no now at ExtremeGenes.com. It is time for this week's edition of our Family Histoire News from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. A woman in Arkansas has celebrated her 116th birthday on the 4th of July. She had a cake and a party and is now the oldest living American and second oldest person on the planet. 
Her name is Gertrude Weaver, and she was born in Arkansas near the Texas border. And get this, she was married in 1915. She and her husband had four children, only one of whom is still living. He's 93 and partied right along with her. Parts of China are now creating traditions that future generations will look back on and say, what? In these places, women are wearing wedding dresses instead of caps and gowns when graduating from college. Someday those graduation pics will be hard for descendants to understand, no doubt. On July 29th, over a thousand often steamy love notes written by President Warren G. Harding to his mistress will be made available to the public. He and the mistress had been together some 15 years when he finally had to break off the relationship when he moved into the White House. It's believed she convinced him not to run for president in 1916, allowing Woodrow Wilson an easier re-election, possibly altering the course of history. Well, next time you're in London, drop by the Red Lion Hotel and say hi to Dolly Seville. Dolly is a great-great-grandmother. Yes, two greats. She's also still working. She is the world's oldest working bartender at age 100. She works at the Red Lion three days a week and has been mixing drinks on demand since 1940. First-year archaeology students at Bournemouth University in England have discovered five skeletons believed to be from the same family over three generations and 70 years, dating back to Britain's Roman era. We're talking somewhere around 300 to 350 A.D. The remains were found near the site of a Roman villa where the students came upon a timber mausoleum. The era of the villa matches the time that the graves were created. The bodies consisted of three men and three women. The women were buried with pottery drinking vessels, while the men were still wearing hobnailed shoes. The students have to be feeling pretty good about things. It's thought that the discovery could lead to a rewriting of the history of late Roman-era Britain. As we approach July 28th and the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I, the curious story of a naval lieutenant named Edward Hilton Young, called Bill, later Lord Kennett, has made some news. During a naval raid on a Belgian port on April 23, 1918, Bill lost his right arm to German fire. Now, 95 years later, his officer braids, which had been cut away from his uniform when he received medical attention that night, have been returned to his descendants. How did this happen? Well, they appeared on the BBC's Antiques Roadshow. We've heard this before. As the braids were shown, the story was told of the man who obtained them back in 1918 on the same ship as Bill Young. The story went that the man who obtained the braids assisted with a lieutenant who had received a very serious wound to his arm. The medic informed him he should keep the braids as a souvenir. Friends of the descendants knew of Bill's story and informed the family of the BBC program. They didn't see it. Connections were made, and the descendants of a man who assisted in Bill's emergency care presented Bill's descendants with his officer braids from the very uniform he wore that fateful night. See the pictures and read more details on this incredible reunion now at ExtremeGenes.com. And coming up next, our first anniversary month continues with a new story source for you. And there are few places better for collecting stories than prison records. This past week, Ancestry.com released a ton of them, covering pens from New York to California, with more to come. What might we find in them? Jennifer Utley from Ancestry.com joins us to give us some insight in three minutes on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Did you know that genetic genealogy can help you break through brick walls and find relatives you didn't know existed? Hi, it's Fisher. Jim used the Family Finder test from Family Tree DNA to find his father's half-sisters. Hi, this is Jim Oxford from Somerville, Georgia. My Family Tree DNA test led me to my father's half-sisters, my aunts, and my first cousins, and I feel like uh, I've known them my whole life. You, too, can use the Family Finder test to find relatives within four or five generations on both sides of the family. 
Family Tree DNA's Family Finder test is regularly just $99. But as an Extreme Genes listener, now is the perfect time to order because for a limited time, you can save $10. Just use the coupon code Extreme Genes at checkout. That's one word. What are you waiting for? Over a million people have had their DNA tested with great results with FamilyTreeDNA.com. And remember to use the coupon code Extreme Genes at checkout for a limited time $10 savings. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history Research with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Jennifer Utley from Ancestry.com. Welcome back to the show, Jennifer. Thanks for having me back. I'm glad to be here. Well, you know, this past week, you released some records at Ancestry that I think uh, a lot of people might not know a whole lot about, and that's prison records. And, you know, if, if you're a real family historian, you're not just looking for births and deaths and marriages and names. You're looking for the stories and who leaves more stories than people in prison. (laughs) Totally. <laughs> now, uh, let's talk about that, because you've released quite a few of them, and it really covers both coasts. And I, Are there any in between? There's some from California. There's some from New York. Right now, we focus on New York and California. They have some of the most infamous prisons in the nation, so they were a good place to start. Yeah, they were. Well, you got Sing Sing. You got Auburn uh, in New York. What's in California? In California, we've got Folsom, and we've got San Quentin. And those are legendary. Johnny Cash sang about those. That's right. right? <laughs> so you know it's got to be bad. I mean, good. Well, for us, it's good. And, and in this case, sometimes bad is really good. Yes, exactly. Now, I don't have any direct ancestors that I'm aware of that were in prison, but I do have some residual ones there. I've got a forger. I've got one woman who kind of ignored her children, and they put her... She just wound up in jail for about 30 days. You don't have just jail records, do you? These are the big prisons. Yeah, these are the state prisons. So what can we expect? What can be found in some of these records that are unique? You know, there's really... Because these aren't standardized records, like a census record, there's lots of different things that you can find in these that you wouldn't expect. I was looking at one this morning for Black Bart, no. <laughs> uh, who was the famous stagecoach robber. And as just as I was looking, if I just look at his here, let me pull it up really fast. It's got 
his name, where he was from, when he entered the prison, what his crime was, but it also talks about his complexion and what he looked like and any distinguishing marks. So along with the facts that you expect to find, you can find information about relationships that they've had with people that will help you build the family tree, and you can learn about their their parents and those types of things. So it's not very standardized, but you can find all kinds of things in it that you wouldn't expect. Now, at what point did prisons start using photographs of the prisoners? I would guess in the late 1800s, and that's one of the greatest things about these. I mean, I think of researcher could have fun just, even if they're not your people, just looking at the different mug shots that there are in these records. And how far back do they go? They started in the mid-1800s, like 1845 for New York, and Sing Sing starts in 1865. The California ones, so they had to start establishing the prisons after the gold rush, right? People went to find gold, but they also went, there was a criminal element that went as well. So soon after the gold rush, they had to start incarcerating people. So those stars grew about the 1850. That's pretty early. That's good. And because uh, I would imagine a lot of us might be aware of some ancestors or relatives who were in prison in the last century, but might have to do a little looking and might find a few surprises in the 19th century. That's right. Tell us about some stories of discovery that you're already aware of, because these have only been out for a few days now. Right, and so it's always fun to look for the famous people in the records. We found the prison records of Lucky Luciano. He was in New York, and he was actually eventually incarcerated for pandering. He has a really interesting record, because when you're looking at that, it shows that he's a barber, and it shows that he's making very little money each week. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, my guess is that's what he was reporting on his taxes. Right. Well, that's how they got Capone, ultimately, right? Because they couldn't get him on crime, but they got him on uh, faking his income tax returns. Right. One of the other ones that we found is Ed Morrell. He was an accomplice of the Evans and Sontag game who robbed the Southern Pacific Railroad in the 1890s. And he later wrote a memoir, and his pardon was championed by the author Jack London, who later used Morrell as inspiration for a character in one of his novels. <laughs> you never know, do you? Yep. I- even back in the day, they found these criminals fascinating people. Yes. And created characters. So with these records, when you find when they come, when they go, when they, they face parole and that type of thing, what other records do you think that can lead you to? Well, that's what's great about it, because the great thing is about criminals, and especially those who were caught, they tend to leave a lot of records up behind, you know, records that really fill in the details about their lives. And so while the prison records themselves hold part of that story, knowing that these people were in prison can lead to other amazing records that are super good at storytelling. And the ones that I think are the best at storytelling are the court records and the newspaper records, because the court records, you really have to figure out if someone needed to be convicted. And with the newspapers, People are telling newspaper stories or trying to sell newspapers. So they're telling the most interesting stories there. So these are really gateway for those two records that tell you more than maybe a vital record like the birth, marriage, and death would tell. So these records are rich in the details about their actions and their politics and their personalities and their communities and even their relationships. Well, you know, I think it's fun because you're right. The two things that are really big right now for so many people, DNA and digitized newspapers, And the digitized newspapers just color everything now in a way that we've never been able to do it in the past. Oh, yes. They're the ones that we use the most often to tell stories when we're looking at stories for family trees. Now, are you guys growing your digitized newspaper collections? Always. They're continually being updated. In fact, we have a site called newspapers.com that's wholly dedicated to digitizing newspapers. You know, it's interesting, Jennifer, I had somebody say to me, you know, these prison records, having them out there and having people getting all excited about finding their criminal ancestors, it kind of actually glamorizes the lifestyle. What would you say to that? You know, I often talk to people, I ask people about their family trees all the time, and it's funny how often people want to talk about the horse thieves in their family tree. That's the first thing that they bring up. It is. It, I, think, I think the Americans kind of feel a little bit of like the Australians do. I mean, the Australians take great pride in having a convict in their tree, right? 
Right, they're all convicts. That's right. So I think the Americans, I think there's like this idea of uh, these were our people who went and settled this unknown country, and that some of them were kind of shady. But, you know, anytime you look into the stories in your family tree, you need to remember that our ancestors lived in a certain place at a certain time, right? Yes. And we can't judge our ancestors by the standards we have today. Our ancestors were people who had to make tough choices, just like we do, and sometimes they made the wrong choices. And I think it's interesting to look at the circumstances of their lives and try and learn from it. You know, I think it can lend relevance to our own lives today. And I think that looking back at the ones that made mistakes, I think we can even find comfort in learning about the mistakes that family members made in the past. And it can help people get through trying times in their own lives. I'm really amazed just how powerful and relevant learning about your family history can be. You know, the people who were the heroes, but the people who maybe didn't make all the right choices. And the heroes don't always make all the right choices either, nor do the scoundrels always make the bad choices. Janet Horvorka, in a recent talk I heard, uh, made a great comment about that, saying, you know, there's a little bit of hero in every scoundrel and a little bit of scoundrel in every hero. Nice. Uh, And I think just learning about the, the situations they were facing and what choices they did have can be really enlightening. That's the whole point of all of this, ultimately, isn't it? It isn't to engrandize us because our ancestors were so perfect, but to find out the choices they made, the mistakes, and the good things that they did so we can learn from both sides of the ledger. Yeah, I believe that. You know, I get such a kick out of looking at these records and see what they did and see how they got out and then maybe try to follow that up and and gather some newspaper stories about the different individuals because anybody who's gone to prison generally is going to make the paper because it's a larger crime. Agreed? Agreed. I also think that as you find these people in your tree somewhere, I think that these are the kind of stories that could also inspire the younger generations. They don't see it as, you know, boarding birth dates and death dates. All of a sudden you've got people who did funny things, and I think that sharing those stories can actually lend more interest to the younger generation as they come up about their family history. Well, Jennifer Utley, thank you so much for your time. And this is very exciting stuff, I think, for a lot of people. they got to open their minds a little that they might find something they didn't expect when they get on to these new prison records that are posted on Ancestry.com. Jennifer Utley from Ancestry, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. And coming up next, it's three guys from Alabama who've put together a little organization called Task Force History, and they research places and bring metal detectors. And what do they find? Well, they had an interesting discovery last week. We'll hear from Heath and Brian and Ray coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio, America's Family History Show. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. And then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. Had a brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson, by calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. With over 35 years of research experience, visit HeritageConsulting.com. Did you know your 
your family's memories are being destroyed a little at a time every day. It's true. Old home movies, slides, photos, and audio recordings fade over time. The longer you delay the digitizing of these priceless artifacts, the more likely it is they'll be gone one day. That's why you need to call the Multimedia Center. I brought in VHS videotape and had them transferred to DVD. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And on the line with us from all over Alabama, we got the uh, Task Force History Group. We got Heath Jones, Ray Camp, Brian Romine. How you doing, guys? Good. Thanks doing for having good. Us now, these guys, in the last week or so, went out with their metal detectors and started digging. First of all, tell us about what you do and why you're doing this. Well, basically what we do, uh, Mr. Fisher, we go out and try to find history, and w- whether it be history from somebody's family or Civil War history, or otherwise. We go out and try to piece together the pieces of the puzzle that sometimes are lost to the textbooks. And so you guys went out to a farmhouse not too long ago and made an interesting find. We did. Uh, I actually own property here in Cleburne County in Heflin, Alabama, uh, that's been in my family for the past uh, 100-plus years since prior to the Civil War. And some of my family had lived on that property, and we went out to that home place and started detecting a little bit, see what we could find. Now, you talk about a home place. Is the house still there? No, the house burned at some point uh, prior to 1913, but it's not really recorded as to when the house was lost. We know it was occupied somewhere between 1840 and 1910, somewhere in that range. And so you know who the people were who lived there? Yes. My grandmother's aunt, and so it would be my great great aunt. And she was there for some time, obviously. And so you went out there with a metal detector. Now, was it you, Brian, that got the new metal detector and said, let's go? Well, yeah, I kind of convinced Keith to let me come over to his place and try it out. He sold it to me. It, uh, you know, detectors are kind of gadget guys. We have to get a new machine every now and then to play with. <laughs> and you need the right <laughs> place to play, obviously. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> now, now, this was where so the house we, stood that you guys went around. And what's your role in this, by the way, Ray? Uh, I was just moral support. <laughs> I, I carried the water. You carried um, the water, okay. No, we were invited out there to Heath's place. We just wanted to find out what was going on in that area, and we kind of spread out a little bit, and uh, Brian all of a sudden was very interesting. I'm definitely going to let him tell you about this. Okay. So what, what did you come up with, Brian? Well, we were scattering around the area. You know, we knew approximately where the house was, and Heath had found an old well out there and, and kind of told us the general area to watch our step. So we kind of fanned out, and I headed towards what I thought would have been the back of the property before it dropped off on the hillside. And just walking along and, and right near a very small tree, I got a, a signal that I thought should have been a penny-type signal on that the new machine. And so I stopped and dug it up, and when I got it cleaned off, I could see that it was a ring. It was bent, of course, but it was an old copper ring, and it was common back in the period around and just after the Civil War for those copper rings to be made and then gold-plated. Uh, it was called a poor man's wedding band. And so at that point, you know, when I realized that I had a wedding ring, of course, I hollered out to Heath and said, I think I got something you might want to see, and so he came over and took a look at it. What do you think about it, Heath? Who do you think it belonged to? Well, I, I believe it's my great-great-aunt's wedding ring, uh, the best that we can tell, and, and it was just exciting, you know, to to have something that's been lost since the Civil War era, it, it was just amazing, and I wanted to take it and show my grandmother, and, and that's what we did. Brian immediately tried to give me the ring. I, I initially turned him down. I, I wouldn't take it, so... Uh, because, I mean, he found it. And yeah, on your with, property uh, he, with he, your he, family. Come on. Sure, I know, <laughs> exactly. but, uh, you know, that's part of it. You know, we find we find relics like those type things uh, occasionally, and so I, I hated to take his find away from him. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, now tell me what you did. First of all, is there, are there any markings on this thing? No, no. It, basically just the, uh, there, there was some uh, gold plating still uh, left on it. And from my understanding, that's kind of rare. Yeah, I would think so. Now, what have you done with it since? 
well, we'd give it to my grandmother, uh, Brian, and, and I'll let him tell you about that. But uh, he presented it to my grandmother, and it's going to be put in a safety deposit box. Talk about that, Brian. What was her reaction when, when you gave her the ring that was from her family's home? Well, it, it, honestly, I think it um, choked her up a little bit when uh, when we told her, you know, where we'd found it. I think she realized that probably there was some family significance to it. And she had a real glow on her face and in her eyes when, uh, when she was holding it, and I could tell she was thinking about the old people in her family uh, that, that have been oh, gone for a while. So. This sweet woman's face just lit up. It did, it did. Um, and bless her heart, she, she said, I wish you could buy it. And I said, well, ma'am, you do not have to buy that. You, you can have it. And, and it, it did my heart good to give it to her. Now, she's, she's like 88 years old, right, Heath? She is. And she actually lost her mother. Uh, this is her mother's sister uh, that we believe the ring belonged to. But my grandmother lost her mother when she was 13 years old. And she lost her dad several years later and ended up being raised by her, uh, her older sister. So finding something from her family, you know, that, that's just... It's hard to come by. Uh, they lost their home uh, to a fire several years later, and you know everything was gone. So this is one of the few things that she will actually have to be able to remember her family by. Isn't that and something? And that's it was so impressive just to see. My grandmother is a woman of of uh, many words. She never has lost her words, and to see her choked up and just be speechless was really rare. Did you video this thing? No, and I wish we had. Uh, I really wish we had. Tell us about the organization you're putting together. You've got a Facebook page going. You've got some followers there. Task Force History in Alabama. And what do you do on that site? Well, basically what we do, like I said, we go out and investigate history. Many of our group members are either military, former military, law enforcement, or former law enforcement. Myself, I'm a former state police investigator. And when we developed this group, we wanted to first find people with high levels of integrity. Because when we go out to a site like this, just like with Brian, it, it, somebody with no integrity could have easily put that ring in their pocket and went about their way so they didn't find anything. But we wanted people that would do the right thing when they were invited to land to find things like that. And so that's why we put that group together, so that we could go out and investigate these type of areas and not have to worry about somebody doing the wrong thing. How many people are in your group overall? We have 35 people in our group right now. Wow. Do you go out in in, uh, little clusters? Yeah, basically, uh, if somebody has a historical area that they want us to investigate, they will call. We'll try to research the land, uh, the history of it, and try to find artifacts tying that history back. Is it usually family history that you discover or something else? You know, sometimes it is family history, but uh, we do a lot of Civil War stuff. Uh, We also do some more of 1812 things. And we've got a project working right now in North Georgia where we're going to check out an area of land that was part of the Trail of Tears. So that's one of the projects we've got going. We've got a cannon that's supposed to be in a river here in Alabama. That's going to be an interesting project. We were contacted by a museum to investigate that, and we're looking forward to that. We're going to, we've are going we got divers on our team, and we're going to send them down, take a look at it, and then we'll be working with a state archaeologist to get that excavated and get that in a museum somewhere. So, Heath, do you guys uh, actually train one another to become more and more expert in different areas of this kind of research? Sure. You know, we have guys that specialize in the research, the actual research part. And we have guys that are just more specialized in the detecting part. And then we have guys that actually do underwater detecting, do the diving. So it's a team effort where we have everybody that will have their own specialization, and we just come together to make it work. That's so much fun. It's basically just a hobby then, right? It is. We're not paid. We don't even ask for money when we get called out to do any of this stuff. So if somebody wants us to come out and take a look at their property, we'll be glad to do it. We won't charge a thing. We just want to do it to preserve history and to help people find more out about their family and their history. And it's the fun of the hunt, isn't it? It is. It's Task Force History. It's Heath, Brian, and Ray. They had a great find here and actually presented that to Heath's grandmother recently, an old Civil War era ring with gold plating on it. Hey, congratulations, guys. Best of luck to you in your future searches. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks for having us. And coming up next in three minutes, are you stuck with some video of Grandma and Grandpa that was recorded portrait instead of landscape? 
Tom Perry, our preservation authority, will be here to tell you what to do about it on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Did you know that genetic genealogy can help you break through brick walls and find relatives you didn't know existed? Hi, it's Fisher. Jim used the Family Finder test from Family Tree DNA to find his father's half-sisters. Hi, this is Jim Oxford from Somerville, Georgia. My Family Tree DNA test led me to my father's half-sisters, my aunts, and my first cousins, and I feel like uh, I've known them my whole life. You, too, can use the Family Finder test to find relatives within four or five generations on both sides of the family. Family Tree DNA's Family Finder test is regularly just $99. But as an Extreme Genes listener, now is the perfect time to order because for a limited time, you can save $10. Just use the coupon code ExtremeGenes at checkout. That's one word. What are you waiting for? Over a million people have had their DNA tested with great results with FamilyTreeDNA.com. And remember to use the coupon code ExtremeGenes at checkout for a limited time $10 savings. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history research Research with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, America's Family History Show. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, with Tom Perry. He's our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. Welcome back, Tom. Good to be back. And uh, we have another question for you. Email to asktom at tmcplace.com. This one from Francine Fiorito in Coscob, Connecticut. And she said, Tom, I recently videotaped my grandparents and the video came out sideways. First Whoops. of all, can I turn it the right way? Is there a way to edit that to straighten it out? And the other thing is that there's all this space above grandma's head. What do we do about this? Composition is very important in, uh, when you're shooting because things can make you feel unnatural when the composition is wrong, like with too much headroom, as we call it, at the top, too much on the side, too much at the bottom. You never, ever want to put your grandma or grandpa or anybody you're interviewing right smack dab in the middle of the frame. What you want to do is imagine on your viewfinder you have a tic-tac-toe. We call it rules of thirds. In fact, some of the newer cameras, you can actually turn that on and off. That will help you compose your pictures better. For instance, you want grandma and grandpa's eyes to be on the top line of the tic-tac-toe, the one that's going across it horizontally, and that just makes it feel more comfortable. You can cut off their head, usually clear down to their eyebrows, and it'll still look okay, 
but you never want people so low that you're cutting their chin off unless you're going for some weird dramatic effect because <laughs> their chin's going in and out of the frame, you know, like a pogo stick, and it'll start driving you crazy. Yeah, you kind of lose the benefit of the stories at that point, don't you? Exactly. Just like when we would go and watch our neighbor's home <laughs> movies, and we'd go back and look at ours and say, our movies really suck. They're the same things. They're the same national parks. It's just the way that you compose it. And maybe in the second segment, I can get into a little bit more on that. Now, about shooting your stuff sideways, you're not the first and you won't be the last. We have people that bring in film that they turn the camera sideways because with a normal 35-millimeter camera, you can do that. And then when you're looking at the print, you can right-side it up. Now, are you talking about film or video here? Both. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, film and video. Because when somebody's shooting an old 8-millimeter film, they would turn the camera sideways because they wanted it in landscape mode or they wanted it in portrait mode or whatever, not realizing that when you take it with a still camera, you can take the print and rotate it. When you're projecting it with your projector or looking at your TV, it's kind of hard to turn it sideways. So there's a couple ways you can fix this. I believe there's a new plugin you can get for Final Cuts Pro that when you're editing it, you can actually take your footage and rotate it. So since you shot it in portrait mode, you can put it back into landscape mode, which is the way TVs are. So if you shot Grandma and Grandpa the other way, they're not going to fit. There's a couple ways you can do this. Either do the way with Final Cuts Pro or a good editing program will let you rotate it. One way that sounds really, really silly, but it's the easiest, cheapest way to do it. You can buy these LCD uh, monitors now for a couple hundred bucks. They're like, you know, 14, 15, 16 inch monitors. And I've actually had people do this, take it, rotate it and shoot the screen. Really? Yeah, just reshoot it. The best is plasma, but you don't want to be rotating plasma screens because they're too heavy. But these little LCD ones, a lot of them have a pivot on them. If not, just fold up the stand and lean it against a wall and reshoot it. If none of these ways work for you, what I would suggest is take the audio part, which is the most important, and put it on a CD, put it on a new track, and just make it into a slideshow. Get photos, get film, get video, mix them together almost like a montage while they're talking, telling their history story. That way, that's probably the easiest way to do it. And that way works really, really good. And I'd suggest something like that. If you have questions, just write me, ask Tom at tmcplace.com, and we can help you with just about any kind of question you may have. All right, we're going to break, Tom. Good advice. And what are we going to talk about next? We'll get into composition, talk a little bit more about rules of third, lighting, and a few other things. All right, that's next in five minutes on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and extremegenes.com. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. And then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. Welcome back. Final segment of Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here with Tom Perry, the Preservation Authority from TMCPlace.com. And we're talking about videography and photography and, and how to do it better. We have so many different devices and types of equipment to use, and yet the rules still remain the same, don't they? Oh, they do. That's the thing that's really incredible is the way they shot daguerreotypes, paintings, you know, murals, anything that you do, any kind of media. If you do these simple things, your stuff will look good. Well, Michelangelo followed these same rules, exactly. did he not? Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Just like when he did David, he just chipped away all the parts that didn't look like David and yeah. came out perfect. <laughs> but seriously, just follow the simple rules. And whether you're shooting with an iPhone, you're shooting with an old Super 8 camera, a video camera, just follow the very simple rules. 
a guy in a black suit, a girl in a white dress, what's the difference? It's the way you compose your picture together that's so important, the way that you light it. One thing that I find, a lot of people try using extra lights to think things are going to look better. Remember, in our solar system, we have one sun. So basically, you have shadows coming from one direction. I see people set up lighting in a house, and there's a shadow going right on Grandpa and left on Grandma. It's uncomfortable, and you don't know why. The reason is you're used to seeing shadows always going one direction, depending where the sun is as it rises in the east and sets in the west. So if you have a big light shining on Grandma from the right and Grandpa from the left— You just made a solar system with two suns in it, (laughs) so it doesn't feel comfortable. You don't understand why, but that's why it doesn't feel comfortable. You want to make sure your lighting looks real and genuine. So if you look at a professional person that's lighting, they'll do what's called like a headlight, which kind of shines on your head to kind of give you dimension, separates you from the background, which is good, but it's not far enough that it's going to throw a shadow off their nose. Then you have a key light, which is your main light, which is usually on your right or left side, depending how you're setting people up. And then you can have a fill light on the other side, which kind of is like a softer light. It's not sharp enough to cast a big shadow on the other side of their face so they look good. And one time when you're interviewing like two people, grandma and grandpa together, you set up a key light on grandma, which can be the fill light on grandpa. Then you set up a key light on grandpa, which is the fill light on grandma. Uh, Hold on. I'm taking notes here. This is complicated. People aren't going to remember that, Tom. So where would they go to find out more about fill lights and key lights? You can go to videomaker.com. They have a magazine that comes out that's all about different tips. Go to their website. It's free. And click on lighting. And you'll find a lot more stuff than you ever wanted to know about it. So just read what you're comfortable with. But even just the littlest, teeniest things make things good. You don't have to become a professional lighter. You don't have to become a professional videographer to make your pictures look good. Just remember you want to light them so it's comfortable. You don't want things too hot. And usually when you're shooting people. If they have light hair, like if everybody in your family is blonde, you want a darker background. If they have dark hair or they're people of color, you want a lighter background so they can actually be separated from the background and it gives dimension to your pictures and looks better. And also, as we talked about in the first segment a little bit, rules of thirds. That's probably the most important thing you can remember. So imagine imaginary lines on your viewfinder that looks like a tic-tac-toe and check your settings. And if you can turn that on, leave it on 24-7 because it's not recording it to your tape. It's just giving you an idea. So as you're shooting your grandson or your nephew or grandma and grandpa, keep their eyes on the top line of the tic-tac-toe so that that gives them good dimension below so their chin's not going in and out of frame. And if they're looking straight at you, kind of center them in the picture. If you want to do a side shot, make sure the extra space is in front of them because if it's behind them, it looks like they're running into the wall. So keep the leading edge, the extra space in the direction they're looking into so they're looking into space and not looking into the side of the camera. All right, Tom, thanks. Great advice as always. And if you have a question for Tom, you can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com, and you might even hear your question answered on the air. That's it for this week. Thanks to Jennifer Utley from Ancestry.com for our conversation about their new prison records that have been released. Plus, the guys from Alabama, Task Force History, with an amazing find this past week. If you missed either segment or you want to hear them again, of course, you can catch the podcast on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And, of course, download our free podcast app to your iPhone or Android device. Take care. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal, Family.